So I'm recording it now. And what we're going to do is we're going to go over kind of all the steps of 3D printing and troubleshooting that might arise with it and different things about how that whole process works. So I'm Drew from NWA3D and these sessions are unlimited too. So if you want to do another one or if there's something you're having trouble with, then we can do another section later to get as many as you guys need to make sure that your students know how to run the printers and run all the different parts of it. So um, have either one of you 3D printed before? Yeah, Jason has. Yeah, yeah, if I've used yeah. a, a, a series of different printers, yeah. Right on. Yeah, what has your experience been like? Good. Yeah, that's, um, uh, you know, there's the, the little things about getting the spacing right between the extruder and the plate and all those kinds of little ins and outs, but uh, yeah, it's been pretty positive. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so you'll see kind of some similarities because uh, most different types of printers, it's probably similar to this where it squirts out plastic. Those are the type of printers that you used. Okay, so those, those are material extrusion printers called FDM or fused deposition modeling. And that's what this printer is too. And it's really similar to those, but it has some things on it that makes it really reliable in a classroom. And that's what we're gonna talk about some stuff. And you'll kind of see probably some similarities with other printers and uh, in ways that it, it, it can be different. But there are techniques and stuff that you can use on this one and then translate over into other printers to help give you more success with your other 3D printing that you're using as well too. So um, this whole process of 3D printing then, uh, as you know, is broken down into about four giant steps. Um, the first step is the longest and what's going to take the most time to do. It's going to be the most difficult. Um, and that is the design step where the students are actually going to create those three-dimensional models on a design program. So there's tons of them that are out there, um, but we have some favorites and we have uh, some tutor tutorials to them on our website too. And we suggest like a great place to start is Tinkercad. Um, so what grade um, do you teach, Donna? This is a K K-5 elementary. Okay, awesome. So Tinkercad is perfect um, to start off with. And it's great even for um, colleges and universities and in high school as well as a great like jumping off point. So Tinkercad.com is a free website by Autodesk. And the, one of the reasons why it's so great is that a lot of the skills that the students can use in that program easily translates up into the higher tier program that Autodesk makes called Fusion 360, which is their new CAD design program that they have. And it's fantastic. And that's like an industry standard um, CAD design program that's free for educators to use as well. So um, as the kids, like maybe some of the fifth graders are, are starting to really get the hang of using Tinkercad, and they can move up into other more advanced programs uh, as well. And Tinkercad, though, is a fantastic place to start. So once uh, you get the kind of the use of Tinkercad, there's also some other ones that you can test out if you want to that also work really well. Um, Onshape.com is another one that's great. And that works really well in a web browser too. So that's one of the great things about Tinkercad and Onshape is you can use them on a Chromebook. Um, so you don't have to have um, any sort of operating system on them. They work on everything, they even work on tablets too. So um, they have their own apps that you can use as well. So they're fantastic to be able to start off with designing. But Onshape's a little bit more difficult and it's more like a traditional CAD program where you're gonna draw in 2D and then pull it out. Like if I was gonna draw this remote, I would draw a rectangle and then I would pull the rectangle out to make it 3D. So it's more like those traditional types of techniques. And another one that helps a lot too to kind of get the hang of everything is SketchUp. Um, and SketchUp Pro is great too because you can actually draw in 2D and then pull it out. And it's not quite as it, it meticulous and advanced as something like Onshape um, is gonna be, or especially Fusion 360, but you can be able to pull out a lot of those different angles to make some really intricate shapes. And it's, it's mostly for architectural programs, but you can have um, install what's called an STL extension that will allow you to export models for 3D printing. Because that's what you gotta do, basically. So after you're doing all those design steps and your students are working on their different projects, and you have to take that file that the students make, and then the students are gonna have to export that file in a .obj or .stl format. So uh, obj is like STL and it has colors, and STL just has all the triangles, uh, and it's a really good mesh. It's the better one to use. So if you have the option to use STL, it's always better to use STL with 3D printing. And then you'll take that file, and you'll put it in a what's called a slicing program, and that's the second step. So that's the second big part of 3D printing. So um, what, what that comes with the printers is a little SD card, and either one that's like this or one that's a USB. And 
On that is Cura, and Cura is the slicing program that we use, and it's free and open source and awesome. Um, and we have Cura 15 on here right now. When we're also, we have the newest version of Cura is out too, um, but we don't have all, we're like almost done with upgrading our, uh, our manual to the, the newest version because they had some, some versions in the middle that didn't really support all different types of printers. And we're about to uh, release that hopefully next week, um, but we didn't want to start with the new one right now uh, without having all the backup support files on um, your SD card. Because on the SD card, the, in the user manual, it'll walk you through step by step by step so you can see all those different parts. But the uh, Cura 15, which is the one that's on there, is still fantastic and it still works great. It's being used all around the world and it's their most downloaded and used version of Cura. So um, if you guys want to go ahead and grab the SD card, then we're going to put that in a computer, a Windows or a Mac. And then we're gonna install Cura. Okay. So I installed yesterday from the internet. You'll find it inside of the Cura folder. Oh, I see. I saw it. It's in there. Oh yeah, that's only version three. I want to do this one. Yeah. So you guys have uh, two SD cards that you guys can use, and this is what will transfer all the files to the printer. And that is that third step. So when Cura is basically converting that file that you made into what's called G-code, which is what the printers read, and then you transfer that to the printer. And that's the third step. So that's just sticking this little SD card in the front of the printer. And then the fourth step and the final step, and where a lot of other troubleshooting comes in, is the print, where you are just going to use the screen on the printer to hit print. I'll see it. It's not showing up in my drive. Not seeing that SD card. <clears throat> um, you try the one that has the USB on it, because the one that's in the package, we don't rip open the packages and install the software and stuff on it. If you use this one, so there's one that's in. It's it's usually black. Sometimes we switch the colors around. It might be green. Hmm. It's like a, a USB drive. Yeah, it's a little. It's like a USB, um, like a jump drive is what it looks like. Yeah. Oh, it's just got USB on one side, and then it has the SD card in the other. It should be in that bag right there, yeah. There you, go. you see it? No, I'm not seeing it. I don't see a jump drive in here, no. Just the cable clippers and some Allen wrenches and... Yeah, it should be like a little USB dongle. That's just all we have is just a USB cable. Um, do, there should be another bag that has a uh, that has the toolkit in it. So that's got like a digital caliper and all that kind yeah. of stuff in it. Yeah, we've got we had that. So we got the digital caliper. Okay, got, it might be in that bag. Yeah, not seeing that either. Got uh, little uh, angle needle nose pliers, tweezers, two putty knives. Yeah, it's only in that bag. Huh. Not seeing it. Well, I can definitely I can send you the link, and then you can uh, get all the files that are on there, and you can use that SD card, and then we'll send you one. Yeah, sorry about that. That's weird because normally it's in that bag with the uh, with all the other stuff. Oh, here we go. It's in the one with the power supply. Ah, you found it. Okay, awesome. Yep. Different bag. There you go. So yeah, the other the other stuff was in the box with the filament. This one was in with the printer. Uh, okay. How did they get that on there without oh. opening it? <laughs> yeah. I'll put that away for you. There, I see it. Okay, awesome. Um, and then if you guys want, while we're installing Cura, you can put together the spool holder, too. Uh, is this what's cut out of plexiglass? Is that yes. 
Holder. Okay. The acrylic. Yeah, acrylic. Sure. And it's kind of it's kind of weird. Like it fits together with if you unscrew this this bolt right here, just like unscrew this almost all the way, but not completely off. And then this just fits in like that. And then you can use the Allen wrench that's in um, that toolkit to tighten it. I think this is yeah. Okay. Need bigger thing. It's a little tricky. I gotcha. Are you selecting components to install? Only uh, it'll be Cura. Yeah. Okay. Two are selected below Cura. Yeah, you wanna you wanna select the one that's blue that has like the blue C because that's the one for your operating system. So we have Windows and Mac on there depending on what you're using. So. Yeah, that's fine. And you can just do all the default settings um, and install it all. And then when it gets to the end, it's gonna pop up with a configuration wizard that says like Start New Machine Wizard, which is gonna ask you what type of printer you have. So you can just say Next and go all the way through those steps. And then when you get to that part, um, then we'll we'll pick that printer. Okay. And I'll walk you through what you got to do. Because this is the, the one complicated part about using it on um, multiple machines is this the initial setup, uh, it is a profile specific. So if you have students log in on different accounts, I'm not sure if you, you do, do you? Or do you use the same accounts? They will log on with their own user name. Okay. So I definitely suggest starting off with like one computer that's the, uh, then having the one computer as the slicing computer. And then if something gets messed up on the slicing computer, then you'll be able to go back right away and be able to tell like what isn't working like it should be. So you don't have 20 different computers with 20 different settings. Um, until kind of the students get the hang of it, you know, after the first couple of weeks, and then they can start installing it on their, their own machines and stuff like that to be able to slice their own files. Because um, we found that that helps out to have like one computer that's kind of designated as the slicing computer. Because every time you log into your account, you'll have to reset up all of these uh, settings the first time you use Cura. Um, and we have a video that's specifically for this, and there's a bunch of screenshots on your SD card too. Your user manual goes through step by step, and then obviously we're here to help too, um, no matter what you need help with. So uh, we'll help you get it installed on all of them if you want, but we found that that helps a lot to have like one or maybe two computers um, to start off with. Because they can design on any computer, and they'll just be able to go to that computer to convert their file. So we're at the point where we're choosing the machine we have. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see the same thing that I see. So, we'll see this uh, add new machine wizard right here. And we basically have to set what operating system we have in our printer and then how large our build area is. And then some other little small settings that are uh, profile specific. So we'll, on select your machine, we're gonna click other as the type of printer, and then hit next. Okay. And then the operating system is Mendel, M-E-N-D-E-L. And then next. And then it's ready, woohoo, not quite. A couple more things. <laughs> so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna set all of these to be kind of medium settings. And there's also a file called a .ini that's on your SD card that you can actually open to do this. So you can actually click file and then open profile and open that INI file that's inside that Cura folder and it will set all of these settings on the side for you. But we're gonna kind of walk through them just so you know what they all do. Um, so the first one is the layer height. So that's how tall each one of the layers are in your model, layer by layer by layer by layer, uh, as it's stacking and as it's building things. So um, with these, they can go all the way down to 100 microns, which is a tenth of a millimeter. And the closer that it gets together, the higher the quality is going to be. And the, what we normally print out, though, is 0 0.2, which is a 200 microns. So every two tenths of a millimeter, there'll be another layer of filament. Um, but if you want to print something really fast and it doesn't have to look pretty, you can actually go all the way to 0 0.3. And then that will vastly increase your, uh, or vastly decrease the time that it's gonna take you to print. So you can set that setting to whatever you'd like. And then the shell thickness, that is gonna be 0 0.8. So we wanna set that to 0 0.8 because that is two passes of the nozzle around the outside part of the, of the model itself. So the shell, the shell is the thickness of the outside walls of your model. So if you wanna make a really strong model, you can increase that shell thickness. So you, if your students want to make something like a gearing system or something like that, they can increase the shell by multiples of four 
to make it really strong and durable on the outside, on the outside wall. So um, 0 0.8 is two shells, and that's a great place to start. Yeah, I'm guessing we're going to have to change the nozzle size at the bottom then to 0 0.4. Yes, that's yeah. exactly what we're going to do. Yeah, so if you can go ahead and change that now if you want, um, because that will make it a multiple of four. Yeah, yeah. You so can see the little yellow will go away. Yeah, the other thing with the the shells that I found is sometimes I've on the models I print, I've tried to do some finishing, some sanding and filling and that kind of stuff, and the multiple shells helps out with that too, so you don't break through the outside with any sanding. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you have supports in the inside. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to sand it down, the support structure isn't printed at the same type of uh, thickness and strength as the outside part. So yeah, it'll definitely like kind of cut through there. And then the bottom and top thickness, you want to have that about the same. Um, but you can have like a really thick bottom and top if you want on, depending on your model and what you want it to look like. But we usually recommend just keeping it about the same as the shell thickness, just so it's even all the way around. And the fill density, that is the infill that's inside of your model itself. So it's a crosshatch pattern that fits in to your model. So it's, it's, we'll go inside like a honeycomb pattern and that will fill inside your model so you don't have to have it solid with filament. So uh, to save a lot of filament, if you were gonna print something like, if this box right here, so this is as big as the printer can print. So this is the maximum size of the printer itself. So it's five by six by four inches. But if you printed this solid, yeah, I mean, this might take, 40 or 50 hours to do, but it only took 13 hours because we hollowed it out. And then it's even inside here, you can, you can kind of see the honeycomb a little bit um, in the walls and in the bottom where it doesn't have to be filled completely in, completely solid. So that's a way that you can drastically cut down on your print time. And, and we normally suggest anywhere between five and 20% um, for the fill density. And normally the smaller your model is gonna be, the more fill density you'll probably want to make it stronger. So it doesn't just fall apart and get really brittle in your hands. Drew, I don't remember with Kira, is there an option of choosing the infill pattern or is it set? You can in the advanced Kira settings if you want to. Yeah, so you can click uh, up here in expert and you can say uh, um, on a switch to open expert settings right here. And you can change all those different types of things. But really, if you're curious about diving into some more advanced parts of Cura, one of the reasons that we love um, Cura 3.03 uh, right now um, and Cura 2.7 too uh, is the all the different things that you can do to change your uh, your model itself. So I'll send you that as soon as we get done with it. And I think that's something that, that you'd really like to check out because you can change like every individual thing. You can even change different layers and what you want it to do on each layer. Um, my favorite feature that it has is called ironing. So you mentioned that you like to do fi uh, finishing on the models and ironing actually takes the nozzle and it retracts mm -hmm. the filament and then moves around a, about a tenth of a millimeter above where your model is to actually melt the layers together to make it look really smooth like as it's moving around. There's all kinds of really advanced awesome settings that you can change in, uh, in, the, in Cura 3. So if you want to change like those different types of infill densities and stuff like that, I definitely recommend checking out Cura 3. And you can right. download that from, um, from the website, just Google um, Cura, uh, Cura, and you'll be able to find it. Um, and, or like I said, I'll send that uh, link out to you as soon as we get it done. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. That'll be, that would be interesting to take a look at. Yeah, there's all kinds of, and it sounds like your experience with 3D printing, and I bet you'll love some of the stuff that you can do, because you can change like every single tiny aspect of it, and it's really easy and intuitive to change it, because here you kind of have to go open the expert settings, or go to the advanced settings, and be able to switch different things around, and it can be kind of weird, and it still it doesn't give you complete total control um, of everything. It gives more control than a lot of other slicers, but not the same amount of like every single minute detail that, um, that Cura 3 um, can do, which is why we're moving to Cura 3. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the next thing is the speed of how fast it's going to print. And from what we found, uh, with FDM printing, the fastest that you pretty much want any printer to go is 50 millimeters a second. Because if it goes too much faster than that, the layers are going to try to stick down. And before one layer is cool, it's going to peel up and it, as it's trying to print another layer on top of it. So if it's trying to go too fast, it can knock your model loose or it can just look really messy or the layers might not be fused together well because they have to melt together. So we found that 50 millimeters a second, no matter what type of printer you're printing with, helps a lot. Like this one will print as fast as 120 if you want to, but um, it has to be tuned perfectly and it doesn't look as good. And it also is also a lot louder because it's moving back and forth um, a lot quicker. On the uh, printing temperature, you want to set that to 220. So we set it to 220 um, because we found that with PLA, especially a lot of the uh, PLA that are out there now, 220 helps to melt the different types of ingredients that are in there that make it a little more malleable. So um, the filament that we have 
Uh, it's from push plastic and toner plastic, and, and it has a special type of ingredient in it that actually makes it to be really bendable and malleable, more so than regular PLA, so it's not nearly as brittle. So that's why it melts at a little bit hotter temperature than other PLA. And we found with, uh, with this printer, it works best to melt PLA at 220. And the bed temperature, we're going to set that at zero because it does not have a heated bed. And you don't need a heated bed for, uh, for PLA printing, which is another reason why we like printing out of, uh, out of PLA because um, it's really easy to print with and, and you don't have to have a, a melted bed to have it like fused down there. Um, it can print really well and layer together without having a, a, a heated bed. Drew, do you, do you put some kind of like a painter's tape or blue tape or something down or do you just print right on the platform? So that's actually what this is. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about that here in a second. But this platform right here is a special uh, type of material called the lock build that is actually specially designed to be uh, porous on a microscopic level to get the filament to stick to it it's really, really well. So it actually, the problem with this one is sometimes it sticks too well to try to get it off. Uh, so that's why we have like the flex plate where you can take it off and you can bend it to be able to pop prints off or get stuff underneath it. Um, and with leveling, that's one of the things that you have to watch out for is it actually having it too close can cement stuff to uh, the lock build surface. And then you just have to kind of raise it up a little bit and print your model again and it peels up really well. But um, that's one of the things that happens with, uh, with this surface is it can actually stick because uh, it sticks better than painter's tape. Um, that's something that you got to watch out for. But we love this because this will last about like probably four or five rolls of tape. Um, and it's made to get really dinged up and beat up. And if you needed a new one, it's just a sticker that goes on top of the of this G Gen flex plate here, and it's only it's only thirteen bucks. So, so the next is support type, and uh, we suggest starting off with support type everywhere. So if it ever needs supports inside of the model, it'll automatically generate them. Because if you were printing something like a door frame, and that door frame would be like on the build plate here, if you had touching build plate it would print all the way that supports up inside of your door frame. But if you had a window like this, then touching build plate wouldn't print supports inside your window and that could cause it to be, to kind of sag down inside of there because it's trying to bridge the filament across those gaps without having the supports. And you can pop the supports out at the end um, and you can even change the distance of how far you want the supports away from your model as well. Um, but we suggest to start off with everywhere, especially for student models, because one of the things that can be tough uh, with uh, beginning CAD design is making sure that everything is touching and, and with perspective. So if you're looking at something like this, it might look like it's touching, but then you kind of rotate it and realize it's not. And if support everywhere, we'll make sure that that'll fill in stuff so it won't just turn into a giant pile of spaghetti when uh, a student tries to print their model. And then platform adhesion type is something else you can check out as well too. So um, if you're having problems with stuff sticking to the build plate, the first thing is making sure that it's level, which we're going to cover here in a bit. Um, but the next is making sure that you have brim on. So if you're printing something really big, you can print with brim. And brim will work like suction cups around the outside of your model. Um, we don't recommend using raft because raft is literally a raft of plastic that goes down on top of the, the build plate. And we think it's just a waste and it doesn't really do anything to help the model stick any better. Um, other than if your uh, printer isn't level at all, it sometimes will help models stick to it better if the printer is not level. But we think that it's a waste of plastic. So uh, you can use brim if you want, if you want to have stuff uh, to help it stick. And then the last thing on here we're going to change is the diameter, and that's 1.75. And you can see that's written on our PLA, too. You can see it's written on there. And then now we're going to change uh, the size of our build plate, and then we'll be done. So to do that, we're going to click Machine. And then we're going to click machine settings. And then we're going to change the width, depth, and height right here. So right now it's set to 200 by 200 by 140. And we're going to set this to 125, which is about 5 inches, by 150, which is about 6 inches this way. So 5 inches and then 6 inches. And then by 100 tall, which is about 4 inches or this big as this box right here. And then we'll uncheck this heated bed right here because it doesn't have a heated bed and that will make this bed temperature thing go away. And then we'll click, okay. Ta -da! So now you probably have a little robot that's right here on yours. And that's the initial model that's loaded on a uh, when you, when you install Cura. But if you want to load a model, that second step where you have your model, your STL file, and you're going to load it into Cura, 
you just click right here to load. So now we have all of our settings set up for Cura. We don't have to worry about going back and setting it up again um, to make sure that everything goes together. So we're gonna click load. And then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go to where I've got um, on my SD card here. So on my SD card, uh, we actually have some SD, STL files if you wanna navigate to there. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the keychain and then hit open. And then you can load as many models as you want. So I could load another model if I wanted. So let's, if I wanted to load the die, I could. As long as they turn yellow inside of here. And you can click and you can move them around. You can right click and move your view. You can zoom in and out with the scroll wheel. And as long as they're yellow, that means that they fit. But if they turn uh, gray, that means they're outside of the printed area and they're not going to be sliced so they're not gonna print because it, it, it sees that it's hanging over. So if you have all the files on there, you can see this is the time that it takes to print too, which is another reason why we like Cura, is because this is really accurate. So this is within about 10 minutes of how long it actually takes and the exact amount of filament. So this is gonna take pretty close to 30, 30 minutes, um, which is really awesome, because some other slicers, they aren't as good at predicting as, uh, as Cura is, which is another reason why we really like it. So we can move our models around. You can also click on them and rotate them. So print orientation is something that you wanna be aware of as well. So I'm gonna right click and move over here. So we wanna have try, uh, try to have a flat surface on the print bed. And if you had this uh, kind of up in the air like that, this wouldn't be a very good print orientation because not very much of it is touching the bill plate. So as the printer is moving around, it could knock it loose because there's not a whole lot of surface area for it to connect. And also if you click view mode and go to layers, you can see it's gonna automatically generate a bunch of supports inside here. And you don't really need to have those supports, so that's just wasting filament. And you can also see the brim right here. Those are the suction cups that I was talking about. So if I turn the brim off, you'll see those will go away on the sides of our model. And you can also see what each individual layer is going to do. So as we move this down, you can check each layer. So this is awesome. If you wanna have your students dive into the G code and actually code, um, what the printer is doing, they can actually scroll down to see what layer they want to maybe change the filament on, and then they can open up this uh, G code file in a text editor and then put an M600 command inside there, and then the printer will pause and they can switch the filament out. There's also a change filament button right here that you can do if, you, if uh, they don't want to code. So you can kind of see all the different views and all the different uh, things that are going to be moving around with your model itself. And I can go back to normal here, and then I can click on this, and I can also scale. So if I wanna scale this and make it a lot bigger, you can increase the size of things. And we, uh, we gave you guys the digital caliper because one of the awesome things about 3D printing is being able to prototype exact models. So down to a tenth of a millimeter, you can design things that are gonna fit in different types of prototypes. But if you're not worried about that, then you can change these uh, different sizes to, to maybe shrink them down so multiple students can print their models. Um, you can multiply models too as you're moving them around. So if you didn't want this to be this large, I could click scale and I could scale this way down. So 1.5 is uh, one and a half times its size, but maybe I just want to go down to 0.5 and go half its size. And then now it's only going to take 60 minutes for me to move everything. So this is a way if you wanted to print multiple student models on here, you can print a lot of models on you on this build service. And that's another reason why we really like this, this uh, model of printers because you can print tons of stuff inside of this five by six by four box. So once we have it all ready to print and we've got everything moved around like we want, we're ready to transfer it to the printer. So that's that third step. So we design our model, we load it in Cura and then got the settings that we wanted over here. And we don't even need to change these if you don't want to, they're set to print. And then that third step is when we're gonna transfer it. So if you have the SD card plugged in, you can click SD right here, and it will automatically save it straight to your SD card. Or you can right click, and you can click Save G Code, and you can save it wherever you want. Um, and you can open up the different tool path to be able to save it. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to my SD card, and we can see it's right there. I can even name another one. Um, and we'll call it uh, the and Dice. There we go. Because one of the things about just making it save it automatically is you can't rename it. So the students wouldn't be able to rename the, the name of their model. So we hit save, and now it's saved to the SD card. So now we'll just eject that from our printer, or from our computer, excuse me. And then we're going to put that in our printer. So that's this right here is the, what all of our files are going to be transferred with. And it fits in the front of the printer right here. Got this little slot right there. And it clicks in and clicks out. 
and then you have your model in there. And then now if our printer was ready to, to print it had filament loaded, uh, we could just plug it in and then hit print from SD on uh, using the screen right here and it'd be ready to go and the robot would just do it. But we have to set it up right now. So that's kind of Cura and Cura is the, the first big um, troubleshooting step too is problems that can arrive digitally. <clears throat> So those type of digital issues can come up in Cura. So do you have any questions about Cura? I don't think so. Kind of makes sense? Kind of see everything's working? My camera is blinking at me right now because um, I think it's got a low battery. So I'm going to plug it in to make sure that we don't get disconnected. So one okay. second. Sorry. Must have came unplugged. There we go. Awesome. Thanks for your patience. So now we're ready to move on to uh, the printer itself. So uh, digital problems, that's the first big troubleshooting step with the process of 3D printing. So making sure that the student's model themselves um, is correct when they designed it and there's not something weird like the walls are way too thin or something like that when they're trying to print. Um, or an issue that happens in Cura. So they're trying to print with the wrong filament size or printing too fast or printing too hot. Or a really common issue too is forgetting to take that bed heating off. And if you forget to uh, change that to zero or, or take off the, the heated bed, it's going to try to heat the bed first on the printer and the printer's just going to sit there and not do anything. And it's going to say bed temp error. Um, and it's not going to do anything. So that's a common thing too. So all those different types of things can arise from a digital issue uh, as you're transferring it back and forth. And there are other three more things though that are common to uh, be aware of with uh, the printer itself. And the first one is integrity. So that's something that we're going to check which is normally fine, but because uh, we ship them, we just want to check and make sure that everything arrives um, in tip-top shape. So we're basically going to inspect it and make sure that there isn't anything cracked or broken um, and there's no, the belts are all, uh, are all really tight. And this is something if you're going to be moving it around a lot too, um, a common thing can happen is these can come unplugged too. So you make sure that each one of your motors are plugged in and each one of the switches that go to the motors too. So this little X limit switch right here, and then the Y limit switch that's down here. These are all plugged in, and none of them have come unplugged. So if you want to just kind of check the printer out and make sure that everything moves back and forth freely, nothing looks bent or broken, the belts look tight, everything looks plugged in, and everything uh, is just looking good. And normally you'll know that it's something wrong with the machine itself. If it makes some like crazy grinding sound, like it's a dying transformer, like gah, 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 or something like that. If it starts making something weird, normally that's just because one of these have come unplugged. Um, Cause they can get caught on stuff, especially if you're gonna be moving them from classroom to classroom and they can get unplugged. So um, just something to kind of watch out for. Super easy fix. So how's it look? Yeah, looks, looks pretty good. Okay, awesome. So um, the next thing is probably the hardest part with, uh, with 3D printing um, with the machine itself, and that is making sure that the build plate is level. So that's what we're going to work on right now. So if you want to go ahead and plug it in, and that's how you turn it on and off. So one of the things that helps this printer too is the reliability of less bells and whistles means less things that go wrong. So with leveling, the students are going to be able to do that all on their own, all manually by changing these knobs here in the bottom. And I'm going to be picking up and moving our printer around while we're leveling it to show you with the camera. But you want to leave yours flat on the table so this z-axis right here doesn't move up and down. Because if it moves up and down, just like I pushed it down, then that'll give you an inaccurate um, level. So you can move it side to side, that's fine. Um, just lifting it up sometimes can, can wiggle it around. Because what we're going to do is we're going to adjust these wing nuts right here, these little nuts here on the bottom. This one, this one, and then this third one that's here in the inside. And we're gonna adjust that triangle to get it flat, about the thickness of a folded sheet of paper from the nozzle to the build surface. So a folded sheet of paper is two tenths of a millimeter. And that's where I mentioned before about making sure that it's far enough away so it doesn't cement to the build surface. Because if it's one sheet of paper, if it's one, one tenth of a millimeter, then that can cause uh, stuff to stick. Um, really, really hard onto this plate. And that's okay if it does, because the easiest way to get something off, if it's really cemented on there, is to go around and turn like each one of these knobs 
about a fourth of a turn looser and then print the first couple layers of your print again and then stop the print and then you can peel off uh, it'll peel off really easily and, it, and all the stuff that might be stuck on there just peels right off so um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna get any sheet of paper and then we're gonna fold it in half and stick it on our printer so let me know when you all got a piece of scrap paper yeah, we're good to okay. go. You're good? Okay, awesome. So now, it's all leveled with the controls right here. So the students are gonna be able to, to pick right here by pressing and spinning this knob is how you control everything on the printer. So we're gonna go to setup, and then we're gonna go to auto home, and then tap that. And that zeroes the printer. So that'll move X, Y, and Z to zero because we're gonna set that height of Z by moving the plate around. And it's okay if our paper moves because we're gonna Put it back under there. And then when it stops moving, that's when we're going to disable the motor. So uh, we're going to go uh, click on this. And then we're going to move to where it says setup. And then we're going to go to disable motors right here. And then that will allow us to actually move these back and forth. So we can move these around and they'll still be uh, at zero. So we're going to start by moving it to this front corner above where this uh, this little wing nut is here on the bottom. The little knob. And then we'll take our folded sheet of paper and we're gonna fit it between here. And it might not fit very well, so you might have to squeeze it to be able to fit it through. So you can kind of pinch the bill plate together and then put the paper through like that. All right, Drew, we're gonna, we're just getting, it, the Z axis is now down at the platform, so we gotta get back to where you're at here. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So go ahead and, uh, yeah, you can stop me anytime. So yeah, just let me know. Just tap this button and then go to setup and then disable motors. Yep, all right, we're set there. Okay, awesome. And then, yeah, we'll just move it to that front corner and then uh, put the piece of paper in between there. And then make sure that your clips are clipped on too for your build surface to make sure it doesn't get knocked off. Y'all got it? It's there. It looks like we're going to probably, I bet it's a little bit close is my guess. Try to put that okay. In. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to check the tension on the piece of paper. So you want this to be coming out, the filament when it's coming out, to be coming out at a 90 degree angle from the nozzle itself. So you have your nozzle and then the filament's going to come out in a straight line. So imagine that it's kind of like toothpaste on a toothbrush where if you've jammed the toothpaste too much into the toothbrush and you squeeze it, not very much is gonna come out. Just like if the nozzle was pushing into the bill plate. So it'd be too close. It might be digging trenches into your model, excuse me, digging into the bill plate, moving around like that, because it's too close. If it's too far away, it's not gonna be able to stick at all. Just like if you were trying to put toothpaste on your toothbrush and you were holding it in the air, that could go all over the place and turn into like giant pile of spaghetti, or it might knock your model loose because it hasn't stuck those first couple layers to the build surface itself because it's too far away. So you're looking for that happy middle ground. And that middle ground is the two tenths of a millimeter. And you want to check it with the tension of the paper, but then you can kind of eyeball it a little bit too when it's printing to make sure that it looks like what it should. And this is the most difficult step because trying to figure out exactly what the tension is that you're looking for can be kind of tricky. So you want to move, be able to move the paper and have it be vibrating as it's moving the paper because you want to have it just above where the paper itself is. So you want to have it dragging on the paper a lot. You don't want to have it to where you barely feel the paper moving at all because you want it to be as close to two tenths of a millimeter as possible. Um, so like mine is too close because it's, it's not moving like hardly at all. So I'm going to lift mine up, but as I said before, um, keep yours on the table so it doesn't get uh, out of whack. And you're going to tighten and loosen this right here. So when you tighten this, it actually pulls this away from the nozzle. And then when you loosen this, it actually pushes it up closer. So if I'm looking right at it and I spin this clockwise, it's actually going to make it tighter on top because it's going to push the spring and push up. So it's not going to move very well. And if I move it counterclockwise, it's going to pull it down and squeeze it closer together. And that's what I want to do. So I can kind of move it a little bit, but not a whole lot. So uh, small increments are best to kind of like move it about a fourth of a turn and then test it and see how it's going. And then move it about a fourth of a turn and then test it and see how it's going. There we go. Now I've got a good drag on it. Pretty close, actually. I had to bring it down a little bit. And then you want to be able to feel that paper dragging. 
when it's above this knob right here. Okay. I think ours is good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So then now y'all can just move this plate. If you push it back here, then you'll be above this knob. And then we'll adjust that one too. So this one is also too tight. So I'm going to go ahead and turn a little bit counterclockwise, a little bit better, a little bit more though, get a little bit tighter. There we go. Maybe just a tiny bit more until we feel about the same amount of tension that we felt on the front one on this back one. So we feel the paper dragging and vibrating on there. So that's the snap. And because it's a triangle, yes. it'll give you a really accurate flat reading. But if you have two of them that are too tight, it'll push up the back corner. If you have two of them that are really loose, it'll push them around like that. So the triangle will help you get your plane straight. But if one of them is really tight or really loose, that will turn make the entire surface not level. I'm going to go just a little bit more. A little so pretty tight. And it can like drag on the paper and even leave marks of filament on the paper. That's good too. Because you want to feel quite a bit of tension as you're moving it around. Yeah. Feels about like the other one. All right. Okay. Got it? Okay, awesome. So then now we're gonna get our inside one. So we're gonna move this to the inside. So you can move this build plate and move this because this inside one is kind of tough to get to. And if you can't reach in very well, I like to pull this out and then tighten it or loosen it a little bit and then push it back and then test it and see how it is. Whoop, a little bit too loose. Go ahead, a little bit that way. Maybe a tiny bit tighter, so a little bit more clockwise and move it back. Sometimes you can push down too on the bill plate to get the paper back underneath it. And then you can test it. There we go. So that's about the same amount of thickness that I have on the other ones. Are you twisting it this direction? Yes. That's bringing it down. So go the, go the other way. Don't I want it tighter though? You want you want it tighter, so you got to turn it. Yeah, towards me. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, it's tricky because you're tightening the springs, which is like when you're tightening it, it's pulling it farther away. So it's kind of counterintuitive. But once you and your students get the hang of it, it'll be a snap. And this is probably 95% of the problems um, that you'll encounter is the bill plate will either be too close or too far away or not even all the way around. So something having to do with the bill plate not being level. But luckily you don't have to do it very often. So it's only when it messes up is when you have to, uh, to change it. So you can have it set, like there's one school that uh, last year they did a training in, I wanna say like October. And then we talked to them again in May and I, uh, I talked to them about how their, their leveling was going and um, they were like, oh, we're leveling? Oh, no, we haven't done that. And it was like a different group of students and they didn't even know what leveling was. And I was like, all right, well, don't even worry about it then. <laughs> you guys are good. So it'll keep its level for a long time. Okay. I think hers is good. Yeah. You got it? Okay, awesome. So what you can also do is if you feel like there might be a lot of filament that's stuck underneath the, the uh, nozzle itself, you can actually heat up the nozzle and then go around and level again. So you can level more than once if you want as well. So like if you start a print and then it doesn't look like the print's working very well and it's like not sticking, then you can go ahead and unplug the printer and then uh, go ahead and go through the auto home feature again. And if that nozzle's hot, sometimes that'll knock off the little bits and stuff that's on there. Um, and you can heat up the nozzle by tapping the button and then go into setup. And then you'll see preheat soft pull right there. That's what we recommend heating it up to if you're gonna be leveling. And preheat soft pull is also what you'll use to remove the filament. So. That is, the, that is the fourth and final part of uh, troubleshooting is making sure that the filament is all flowing in there correctly. So the nozzle has to be hot before you're pulling filament out or putting filament in. And the preheat soft pull when you're taking filament out, it doesn't heat it all the way up to the melting temperature. It's only at about 100 degrees Celsius. So you pull it out of the semi-solid state to pull a lot of the gunk and stuff out um, inside of your nozzle itself. And by pulling it out and doing that, that is like changing the oil in a car. So if you, every time you switch the filament, you use that preheat soft pull, and you can do this on any printer, um, to be able to pull that filament out at 100 degrees, then it'll just pull out all the gunk and bits and particles and stuff like that, that build up that gets inside of the nozzle and, in, uh, and around the, uh, the heat sink. So it'll pull all that type of stuff out of there. Um, and if you're gonna load the filament, then we're gonna do preheat PLA. 
And that's how it'll heat it up to that 220 because we want to push through to push the filament through that old color of filament. And also you can force a clog out by heating it up to preheat PLA, you can actually push a clog out. So, um, and if a clog happens, you can actually do a soft pull to, to uh, keep pulling it out. And by doing several soft pulls, normally you can do that and that will clear off any type of clog or any, any sort of weirdness that's going on inside of your nozzle itself. Um, another thing that's really nice is the gearing system is far away from the hot part. Uh, and the only part that gets hot is inside this heat shield. So because that gearing system is far away, that will also cut way down on clogs and things like that that are happening. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and raise our, um, our Z axis up. So there's two ways we can do that. We can either uh, twist this lead screw right here, or I'll show you how to do it with the screen so the students can actually click on it with the screen and then move it up. So you can tap this button right here. And then go ahead and move to where it says controls. And then we're going to move axis. And you can move any of the axes by doing this. So we're going to go one millimeter. And then if it's hot, you can move the extruder out. But in this case, we're just going to go to Z. And then go ahead and just spin it. And go to about at least 20. And that'll just raise it up off the bill plate a little bit. And then we'll be able to see when we push the filament through, we'll be able to make sure that, excuse me, it's all feeding through correctly. And you can tap the back button to go back, but after a little bit, it'll just um, go to sleep and go back to the main screen. So now we can go ahead and tap this button and then go to setup. And then we're gonna go to preheat PLA and then tap that. And then now we'll see that our he heating temperature right here is starting to heat up. So the only part that's gonna get hot is the nozzle that's underneath here. So. Um, None of the other parts of this gets hot except the nozzle itself. So none of these other parts will get hot. And you can see that even while it's printing, uh, you won't be able to even get your fingers through there without like knocking the whole model out of the way to go get to it. So this heat shield protects all that. And while this is heating up, we can go ahead and get our filament ready. Yeah, so if you want to grab the color of filament. One second, Drew. Yeah. So we're preheating PLA, right? Just want to make yeah. sure. Okay. Yep, preheat PLA. All right, filament. Yeah, you can go ahead and grab whatever color you want. Yeah. <laughs> Yellow is perfect. So do you guys have any questions on like leveling um, or dealing with clogs or anything like that? Uh, just uh, the temperature of the, where it comes out. Students easily get burned? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Yeah. No, like we have these from first grade all the way up to colleges and universities. Um, the only way you're going to get burned is if you physically push your finger under here to tap it. Like I'm even tapping on it now and because it's covered up by, um, it also has a, a protective um, wrapping around it to help prevent. So the only part that gets hot is that nozzle that itself. Like it'll get pretty warm, but you'll have to actually push the model out of the way to be able to touch it. So, and I've, I've been doing this now for almost three years and I've only had one student get burned. And he was a sophomore, and I was talking to him about, uh, I'm talking to the class about the parts of the printer that get hot, and he was like, you mean this part right here? And he, like, moved his finger in and touched it. And I was like, yeah, dude, are you okay? <laughs> um, and it blistered a little bit, and he had some aloe vera, and he was, he was fine. He was the, you know, the tough 16-year-old that, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's, not, it's fine. Yeah, it's, um, and that's the only uh, thing that we've had that, that it, uh, um, has happened. But even then, it's only going to get up to, uh, like, as hot as your oven would um, to be able to heat. So it's Celsius, but it's still only going to be, and you're going to touch it. Like the worst that it's going to do is give you a blister if that does happen. And that's what happened to him. And he got a, he got a bandaid and, and he was fine, but I haven't heard of anything because we ask about that a lot. And especially in our elementary schools. And I, I've never heard of anything happening with it because normally um, what, what teachers will do be like, as it's moving, just don't touch any part of the printer itself, only control it with the screen or by unplugging it if something goes wrong. Cause if you grab onto this or, it, um, or even this right here, you'll see that it's, it's hard to even get your finger pinched in this as it's moving around. Um, but if the students grab onto this or stop it, it's gonna mess their print up. All right, looks like we're preheated. Yeah, okay, awesome. So we can get our filament and then go ahead and unwrap the plastic from it. And you don't have to worry about wrapping the plastic back up, it's, it's fine. Um, and then when you're not using the filament, you wanna make sure you pull it back through these holes in the side so it doesn't come untangled. And you don't have to worry about making sure that um, the filament 
is it going to be in a spot that's, you know, like moisture free or anything like that? Um, all of those about PLA breaking down and, and, and all of the different types of things are uh, a rumor mill of the internet. And this will just sit on here, just like that. And then when we're ready to feed it in, it's going to feed back through this part right here. So um, we'll take it out of the hole on the side. Let me know when you're ready. All right. And then go ahead and clip this using the clippers that you have inside of uh, your toolkit. Because you want to clip off the melted bit that's on there to make it easier to flow in. So you don't have all this melted stuff that you're always pushing back into the printer. And that will help to prevent clogs as well. Uh, Drew, do you, do you cut it off flush at an angle? At an angle. At an angle. Okay. That's yeah. what I wanted about. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's almost like a like a spear. Yeah. And that'll also make it easier to push through right here if it's at a little bit of a of an angle. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then you're gonna push it through this part right here. And then the loading and unloading is the same, and you just have to disengage this gearing by pushing on it. So to pull the filament out, you'll squeeze this and pull it out. Or to load it, you'll squeeze this and push it in. And it has to go through this hole and then through this part right here in the throat and then all the way through this tube, all the way till it doesn't go anymore. So if you squeeze this and then keep pushing, it'll push all the way through, all the way to the end. And then if you push a little bit more and it's heated, you'll see the filament coming out the end right there. And then that's also why we gave you guys um, the tools, like the tweezers and the pliers and things like that. So students are never reaching in with their fingers and getting close to that nozzle. They're always using the tools to reach in and grab it. The filament coming out down there. Because the filament, it cools instantly in about five seconds. But the nozzle, as I mentioned, is really hot. So you want to always use the tools while you're reaching in to grab stuff. I mean, anything that's awesome is going to be a little bit dangerous. And you don't have to worry about unloading the filament every time um, a print's done or something like that, too. You can leave the filament in for years, and it'll totally be fine. All right, dude. So pushing pretty hard. Uh, I've, I, it's that all the way through the tube, but I think at, at this point we're at probably where it's heating, and I cannot push the filament anymore, and nothing's coming out on the other side either. So did you, did, did you see it go through the tube as you're pushing yeah. it through? Yeah. So it's probably caught, like, is it, sometimes if it's curved a little bit, it might be caught right here. So you can kind of pull it up and then push it down again a little bit more. Okay. And that'll help you get past that part. And if not, you can pull it back out and then kind of straighten it and then clip it again into a little bit of a point. Did I get it through for you? Guide it back. Yeah, there we go. Just had, awesome. to, make the, just had to have that white to be more up and down rather than sideways, so. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, then you can you can see that'll purge out your other colors of filament. It can push clogs out that way. Um, and you can just reach in with your tools and pull the filament right away from it. Tweezers or uh, pliers there. And then now go ahead and unplug the printer. So the reason that I had you all do that is one of the common issues um, that happens with 3D printing is when students will change the filament out um, or they'll stop a print and they'll forget to unplug it because if it stays heated and there's filament in it, that is the number one reason that clogs happen um, because the filament is staying inside of that nozzle and it will actually bake in there and turn into carbon and it will melt the filament above where that heating core is and that can cause all kinds of issues. So one of the things that we always recommend is when it's not printing, just have it unplugged. Because then you won't have um, like some students changing the filament out and then the bell rings and then they leave and then nobody else 3D prints that day and then your printer stays on and heated for like four hours till the end of the day when you see it. And then that can cause some issues with, with clogs. And you can get those clogs out by doing softballs and stuff like that, but it just helps to save a lot of headaches by just having it unplugged. Every time you're not using it, just have it unplugged. So if it's not printing, it's unplugged um, because then that will just make sure that it's cool. Now, when uh, if you want to print something overnight, so if you're going to print something that's like 150 hours or something like that, that's totally fine. 
because it's going to pu push the filament through and continuously be feeding filament into uh, the nozzle. So it's not going to stay in there to bake in there. And when it gets done printing, like if it finished at 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that, it's going to move to the side and then automatically cool itself off. So it's okay that it's on and cooled off, then that's totally fine too. And there's actually a cool down feature um, that's in the setups uh, too um, that you can have your students go to. But usually it's just easier to just have it unplugged if it's not being used. So we're ready for that fourth step, that final step to be able to print. So go ahead and plug it in. And then we've got our filament loaded. We've got our SD card in the front. Uh, we've got it leveled. We know everything's ready to go. So we'll just tap this button right here. And then if we change the SD card when it's on, you'll say refresh SD card to reload it. Sure, we need to, um, our SD card it wasn't saving to. Yeah, the one that you saved to it. Yeah, yeah. go ahead and stick it in the front. We uh, had some trouble saving to it because it was saving to the flash drive. Yeah, I think drive. it saved to the flash drive, so. Like what, the flash drive that you had in there? The, the one yeah. That, yeah, the one that yeah. had the... Oh, so well, that that's the SD card. Yeah, so that's okay. So just pull the SD card out of, like it comes out of the back of it. No, I yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I think it, I think what it did is it saved our. I think Kira saved the. Well, maybe not. I guess, but I thought it saved it to the um, to the actual USB drive, not the micro SD card. Oh, um, if you were you using this one. Yeah. Well. The one that you sent us with the Kira software. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so this is, it, it's saving it. This is just a dongle, so this doesn't have any sort of storage on it. So it's sorted on this. Okay, sorry. Didn't oh, that's all. That. Yeah, okay. yeah, so it just saved it onto that thing. So yeah, just go ahead and grab that, and then we'll put it in the front. And we'll figure out if it's saved on there in a second, because we're going we're gonna to access everything that's on there. So you guys have it in there? Just pull it. Just pull it, yeah. Pull that, and then it'll go right in here. Ooh, that's fine. Yep. So if if we use the USB cable though to connect it, we'd have, we could avoid the the fiddliness of moving the card and all that kind of stuff, right? If you want to, but uh, we don't recommend that. And from our experiences from schools, uh, if you use the SD card, it has to be tethered to the machine. So uh, a lot of teachers will want it to have it in a different part of the classroom that doesn't have a computer right next to it. So it has to stay tethered to the machine the whole time if you're going to print from the machine. It can't go to sleep because if it goes to sleep, that will fail to print. Yeah. can't get turned off, the program can't get closed because it's continuously sending all that information to the printer itself. And from what we found, it's a lot easier to have it autonomous and everything saved onto the SD card. But if you want to do it with connected with the USB cord, you absolutely can. Um, and Cura 3 has, is way easier to do that than Cura 15. Um, you just literally just plug it in and it'll automatically read that your printer is plugged in and then you can send files straight to it. It's super yeah. simple. Um, so if you prefer to do that, that's why we give you guys this, this cord. You totally can. Yeah. Well, the main times I've done that is when I'm trying to troubleshoot some kind of like little nuance setting like oh okay it's not quite sticking right I need to change the speed or do something like that it's nice to have that instead of taking the card out resaving it putting the card back in having it hooked up you can just quickly yeah if you want to do that you totally can yeah absolutely it's all it's up to you so it's your printer and you literally can't void the warranty so like if you knock it off the table when it's plugged into the computer and it rips out the the uh the slot that's plugged into the front of the usb like that's all covered under warranty you can't look you literally can't board it in the first year so however you want to use your printer it's yours um have fun and we'll help you every step of the way so we know we print from usb before too so um we've, we've done that extensively as well so um if you ever need any help troubleshooting anything um that's what we're here for so you guys uh, ready to print yeah I, I think we are okay awesome so go ahead and tap the button And then if you took the SD card out while it's on, then go ahead and go to refresh SD card. And then go to print from SD. And then you should see your file saved right there. So I've got keychain and dice right here that I saved. And then just tap on it to print. And when you tap on it, it's automatically gonna heat up to the printing temperature, zero itself out, and then start printing. So you don't have to do anything else. It's just done. But the robot isn't gonna know if it's clogged or if it's not level or something like that, it's just going to continue to do its thing and it's not going to know. So it's really important to watch like the first couple layers to make sure that they're sticking really well. And if you see those first couple layers sticking, then there's a 99.9% .9 chance that it's going to finish. Um, 
So just another question, Drew, as I look at the little uh, clips that are holding the blue surface mm -hmm. on there, is it something to watch out for? I mean, are the, are the clips sized appropriately? So if a student like put those on, would it be a chance that the uh, nozzle would clip, would clip those if they're pushed too far in? It could if they try to print all the way to the very end of their build surface. So this is the biggest that it can print. So if they try to print something that's as large as this whole thing, you can see that we actually took the clips off and we use double-sided tape when we printed this okay. because it actually takes, it's going to take away, you know, like five or 10 millimeters in this corner that you can't print on. Um, but for most things, you're not going to be printing out um, in those far corners, but you can like move one to the side if it gets caught on there because what the nozzle is going to do is it's just going to push it off. Um, you just want to make sure that you don't have it clipped in this corner right here because if it's clipped in this corner, this is the corner that it's going to zero on and it is going to hit that and that could cause it to not go down all the way um, to, uh, to, it thinks that it's zeroed out, but because it just pushed this down, it's not zeroed out. So you want to just make sure that you have it over in this corner like that. Um, and you want to also just make sure that they're on there because if this w moves and wiggles, then that will mess your print up as well. And that's why we have this flex plate because it's really easy to remove. And that is just the downside is you have to have these clips in, uh, in the corners. But you, if you want to put them on the sides, you can. Um, you just can't really put them on this side either because it'll, it'll clip this as it moves back and moves by. Um, so you can totally experiment and put them in the different corners if you want um, and experiment like where you have them clipped. Because um, like if, you, if the student was going to print something that kind of went out on this side, you can move this over here and then it wouldn't be in the way of that corner. And then their model could be able to go over here and print around it. You can totally move those around. I hear it going. It's going. How are those first couple layers look? Yeah, pretty good. Let's see, we had brim set, right? So it's doing the brim first? Uh, yes, yeah, so if you had that set. Yeah, it'll go like around the outside edge. Yep. And then go to the inside and then do a little square if they were about. If that was the other thing I was thinking about with those clips is even if the object isn't uh, as big as the build platform, the brim's going to extend that dimension and it might. If you're printing with brim, yeah, it can. And, and you can also, like, as it's going around, you could take a clip off and then, like, let it do the brim around the edge. And as long it. as you didn't move it like I just did because this is totally going to mess it up. Um, then and if you take that clip off and let it do the brim and then very carefully put the clip back on there when it's done, you could do that as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. What do y'all, y'all have any more questions for me? Is that all I got? Yeah. <laughs> That's all you have. This one. <laughs> um, but if you want to do like an advanced one with Cura 3, we can definitely do like a super advanced one where we dive into the all the in-depth craziness of this printer. So if you're curious in doing that, just let us know. That's why we have the unlimited training. So we can tell you about tons of more detailed information um, about Cura settings, about um, different model orientation, about how the printer is moving around and how it's working. Like we could go into all those details and stuff for you if you're interested in it. Yeah. No, looks, looks like it's up and running. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So what's the first project that you're gonna work on with your students? You have something in mind? Good question. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> well, uh, what, what, what do you teach? So I'm, my title here is technology coach. So I work with okay. the teachers to integrate the technology. So working with all grade levels. Um, I know they, uh, the fifth grade, fourth grade team, they like to do inquiry based kind of projects with the kids. Mm -hmm. Taking something along those lines, but I also want to maybe for the first thing that they ever print is have it be something that they're solving a problem to. Yeah, so yeah, totally. Not exactly so, that's going to be yet. <laughs> you can also have them uh, start something. So um, kind of have them explore a classroom. So one what one uh, makerspace did is they had kids. Uh, think about like something that they could fix inside of their school and what they could find, and the the, the little like parts on the bottoms of the chairs, on the, the bottom feet of the chairs that always fall off to make the chairs rock. Um, they printed new feet for all of them. So they used the calipers to design new feet that were custom made for um, each one of them to be able to, to design like all those different types of things. Um, and one of the, the daunting steps can be working out like Cura and how Cura is working. So what helps to start out a lot too is something that's simple um, like a keychain. 
or something like um, some sort of holiday ornament or something like that um, that they could kind of work on that maybe it's to uh, something that could be part of a bigger project, but they would start small with the, like first you have to make your, your nameplate for your, um, your gearing system or something like that. So you can kind of uh, learn how to manipulate objects like in 3D and how to add letters to them and kind of see that whole process of 3D printing and how it looks like. And then they have, um, you know, their nameplate for the doorstop that they make. Maybe they want to make doorstops for the classroom or something like that. So they want to see like how, what level, um, if they're going to do like inquiry based, like how tall does the um, doorstop need to be to be able to stop it? Or what type of uh, textures and, and friction does needs to be on the doorstop? You know, what kind of layers or how would that be for it to actually stop and hold the door um, to not like just be pushed right out of the way and stuff like that. So um, I would definitely suggest starting small. Um, because especially with the first project is not trying to do an entire thing that's um, that's uh, really huge like projects is going to take a couple weeks um, because starting really small you can kind of figure out a lot of the kinks because it's complicated like 3d printing is totally complicated and uh, and it's also the the CAD software is especially complicated so starting off kind of small um, the, the students can kind of figure out a lot of those different steps and then they can easily like move up into uh, more advanced projects and more advanced things because then they kind of have a hang of how the programs are working and you can use Tinkercad all the way down to first grade. Um, if you can use a mouse and you just need to be able to click and drag and, uh, and to, to be able to manipulate it and move around and if you can do that you can use Tinkercad. Yeah, one project that gets especially this time of year, if it starts this time of year, is we've done holiday cookie cutters. Yeah, that's great too. Yeah, it lets you kind of get that hole, the idea of the hole and the negative space, and, and it's a simple yeah. outline basically. Uh, so, yeah, it's another idea. A word of the wise on the cookie cutter. So, just, uh, just so you know, um, there should be like one use cookie cutters so they yeah. don't try to reuse them a bunch of times because the way that um, filament is melted, even if it's the FDA approved filament, because um, we've done a bunch of research on this, so it's still going to be porous on a microscopic level. So yeah. even if it's food safe, because it's melting it and layering those layers together, um, bacteria and stuff can still live inside of it. So if it's a cookie cutter, um, just make sure that they're like, it's a one use cookie cutter, or they put saran wrap down on top of the cookies and then use the cookie cutter or something like that. Yeah. Um, just so, just so you know, for like food safe stuff, they're going to make utensils and things like that. Um, yeah. Just we've had a, a bunch of schools ask us and work about on projects and stuff like that. So um, just so you all know. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. And if you get want any uh, other ideas, like we'd love to work with you and see like what standards you want to integrate or, or what subject you want to work with. Because I'm a certified teacher and we have another certified teacher on staff too. Um, and we love to help just come up with ideas and, and different things that, uh, that you can work on. So if you're curious on like, I, I really want to try to integrate this into our Civil War lesson, or I really want to try to work on um, getting this um, worked into, you know, like a, uh, an English lesson, you know, like the Red Badge of Courage or something like that, or Scarlet Letter, or like how can we move that in there, then um, just let us know because we'd love to, to help come up with those types of ideas and, and help you brainstorm. Very good. All right. All right, guys. Well, yeah, let us know if you have any help. I'm going to send you um, this link and any other information, um, the, all the other stuff, like how to get to our troubleshooting, which is the quickest way to uh, request support um, by uh, going to our, our website and, and hitting, hitting request support. Um, and all the, these different videos and all the information and stuff that we talked about. Um, so if you guys have any questions at all, um, just email me and, uh, and I'll help you out. All right. That sounds good. Thanks, Drew. All right. You bet. See you all later. Yeah. All right, have a good, have a good one.